So this is old and new uh, work. Some of the field work for this paper took place in 1991 to 93. Um, and some of the field work is taking place right now. Uh, some of the, the field work in 1991 to 93 took place in Yogyakarta, Indonesia, in an a urban compound in that city. Um, and I have since uh, coming to Ari this year, returned to uh, um, some of the people involved in that early field work who are involved in this uh, study that I'm presenting today and have talked to them about my earlier analysis and so some of that will be in this paper as well. So um, the Jogja field work is old and new in time. And uh, the other field work, uh, as some of you know, since coming to Singapore, I've been playing music uh, here with a couple of local musicians. Um, and uh, part of that is in this paper today as well. So that's new field work for me. And I'm not entirely sure if it's field work. Um, but I am learning an awful lot about Singaporean society, and so I think it is becoming a project. Working on this new idea that I call deep sound. So it's obvious that I take it from deep play, okay, from Clifford Geertz's famous piece about a Javanese, uh, uh, a Balinese cockfight. And here, again, um, I'm emphasizing the idea of sound in social relation exchange. And so I began to look at sound as a, a manner in which um, this occurred and this happens, that sound, in fact, um, uh, is a form of exchange and uh, the kinds of things that it exchanges. I'm drawing on um, musicians here uh, who talk about the, uh, sound as, as um, evoking attention. Okay. And so uh, I began to work with this idea, um, and that whether someone pays attention or not isn't so much uh, uh, the point, the fact that a sound has the capacity to evoke attention and therefore evoke and engage forms of participation. My interest in, in sound here, in deep sound, is to see the ways that sound evokes participation and exchange in the milieu, okay? So I draw from Foucault's work, if you just take this statement on its own, a certain number of combined overall effects bearing on all who live in it, the milieu, then it does sound like the environment, okay? But he was interested in how these effects, again, evoked attention, exchange, relationships, and he talks about devices of saturation that intensify local experiences. And of course, he was always interested in the body, right? And so um, there is a sense of that these devices of saturation are some forms of embodied history are evoked embodiment within the context of social relationships. So deep sound for me is a device of saturation. It's a point of intensification and in local experience. So, two examples today to kind of lay out this groundwork and see if any of this works. Kronjong music in a Javanese neighborhood, blues and beat music in Singapore guitar shop. Okay? So when I was asked to write about music, it caused me to reflect again upon sound in the neighborhood. And so the first thing I did was to de try to describe the soundscape of the neighborhood. And I suddenly realized that actually I was hearing an audible sociology. That if I listened and learned how to listen, I could listen to social positions, statuses, roles, tasks, obligations, subject positions of men and women, old and young. Numerous other subject positions are audible in the noise of daily life. So what I had was an audible dialogue of social structure event. Now this is the band that played for about a month across the street from where Jan and I lived in this neighborhood for about a little less than two years, 14 months or so. And this band appeared on the front porch of, this, of a man's house um, who had just moved into the neighborhood like Jan and I almost about the same time, he with his family as well. 
And these guys played every night for about a month. And then it stopped. 20 years later. In this neighborhood, suddenly this music appeared, Crone Jong music. And so I began to look at this kind of use of sound in the neighborhood as, again, circulating, being exchanged, trying to call attention to sets of social relationships. And so I had to, I began to think, so if, why did these guys choose Crone Jong? Why Crone Jong? Okay, if it has a personality, if it has an identity, why why did they choose this one to play? Is it just because the guitar? Because it's easy to get the guitar? Is that why? All right. Well, certainly they chose this music because they could play. The, the instruments were easily portable. They could be brought from one neighborhood to the other, set up. Okay, that's one reason why they chose it. They chose it because this man sponsored it. Pot Wyon. Okay. The guy who lived across the street from me, he, had, he and his family moved in with Jan and I. They were strangers to the neighborhood, just like we were. People were just as apprehensive of him moving in as they were of Jan and I, just in different ways. Pencil-thin mustache, and he was a man of modernity in the neighborhood. Okay? He was clearly involved in the kind of circulation of consumption that many of the men in the neighborhood did not have access to for a variety of different... If I would have just looked at Crone Jones, when these guys asked me to write this paper, if I would have just stayed at the representation level, okay, I would have, from those three examples that I showed you, I could have talked about, oh, Crone Jones has this sense of uh, uh, emotion and, you know, human irony of love. It's, you know, both hurts and it's beautiful. You know, that love is like a rose. It smells great, but it pricks you, you know, at the same time. It's full of longing and lament, has this, uh, the voices quaver, the music is, can be very sad, it draws people to tears. It also represents a cosmopolitan urban history. It often uses pastoral images, especially in the, the, the karaoke versions of it, uh, but also in the lyrics. The, one of the most famous songs, Bangawan Solo, is all about the, the countryside and the river that takes the, the people from Solo down the river out to the trading ships and away into some other trade, into the trade world. It's an interesting song, actually. Um, it's the music associated with Indonesian, with the rise of the Indonesian nation state. It is the music that there were discussions about which music to use to represent the Indonesian state. Gamelan was in the mix, but it was too Javanese. Okay, Kronjong, because of its otherness, because of its lack of ethnic identity, its association with urban history. And, and uh, um, it became the music of choice, and it still remains. All right. But it also has, as you saw with the song for Anna, um, something going on in terms of gender. And I hope you can see this. because the Crone Joe musician is coming to town. The loose, mobile, unsettled, unmarried, male guy 
who will take your girl away, your daughter away on the back of his motorcycle, okay, or walk off with her back in the days before motorcycles, okay. The Kronjong players in Indonesia were men, okay, and often seen to be as kind of wild, on the loose, unstable, unsettled, someone to watch out for. Hide all the women, okay, as the blues singers used to say in the south of the United States. Many, many more underemployed and unemployed men than women in the neighborhood, okay. The employment rates and underemployment rates among men were much greater than among women. Women had an easier time to get a So there were many loose guys that could come over and hang out at Pak Wayang's house who had a little money and hang out for the day and do run errands for him and get some small sums of money for cigarettes and so forth and gamble a little bit, drink a little bit, shoot the breeze, be a man. And found in my notes that women actually had expectations about getting work compared to the guys. Okay? And I found this paper on something called the open unemployment rate. But here's the un open unemployment thing. Now, open unemployment is an interesting idea. It is, if you have a higher rate, that sounds like it would be a bad thing, right? Open unemployment. But what it means is that you expect to get a job. You're actually thinking about looking for a job. So if there are higher rates of people who are thinking about getting a job or expect to get a job, that means that they, they think they can get a job. And the rates are higher among males in urban areas than among, I mean, among females than among males, okay? So this was kind of this, this, you know, sociology, at least around work and, and labor that p was playing out in the neighborhood. Women at least believed, or perhaps if, this, if I can translate this data to my notes in my journal, that they actually might get jobs where the guys didn't even think they would get jobs. And anyway, they had these outrageous expectations about the kind of jobs they would actually do. They weren't going to do construction. They weren't going to be a janitor. Women had become increasingly the focus of Indonesian development efforts through a women's organization called Pei Ka Ka. All right. Women became much more involved in the public spaces of the neighborhood doing development work, cleaning up the place, making sure older people got to hospitals, making sure kids were weighed, <laughs> and uh, their nutritional status check, checking the blood pressures and the blood glucose levels, of, was the space in the neighborhood was changing for men. What had once been public space where men, and as they would stand up in front of microphones at the circumcisions and the weddings and give the formal prayers, that that power had become, was still there, but it had become hollow or at least disenfranchised to some extent, at least as life was changing, and that women were becoming much more important in the public spaces of the neighborhood, uh, and that these men felt this, okay? Distribution of resources, power, prestige had changed because of the need for development and the focus on women's activities and women's labor to enact development, um, and that the space had become feminized as a domestic community. This is literally yanked out of Jan's book. Okay? And that this Kronjong music, this cultural production, took place within what I, with this real politique of community life. All right? The milieu. Right. Well, these guys maybe were playing music, doing this for a variety of different reasons, to hang out, to have fun, but also perhaps it was a kind of agonistic display, an argument, a play of tropes, okay, of men and male masculinity given the associations of Kronjong music with wild, unregulated, unsettled men in a place where that, their positions as men were becoming increasingly disenfranchised, okay. And so the music was a poetics and politics and an ongoing set of social relationships. Ships in the neighborhood had something to do with the beginning, perhaps, but certainly the end of the music. We began to see that perhaps making Kronjong was um, a way to kind of capture, absorb, 
work with, respond to these changing sets of social relationships in a place like this urban neighborhood uh, uh, in, in, a, a, in a very local way. Okay? Beyond, not using the laws of the court or the police or the, the, the institutions of the government, but the local institutions available in the neighborhood, what um, Nancy calls a simple jurisdiction. A music in Crone Joan, like the rough music, was in some way a mode of life in which some part of the law still belongs to the community and is theirs to enforce. If I would have stopped at representation, which was what, where I was first going to begin with this paper on Crone Joan, I wouldn't have captured sound to this kind of depth. Okay, and so that's what I'm trying to do with this concept of deep sound. Ever since I arrived here, that's what I've been doing. And I've been hanging out with this guy, Keon Lim. Who is this guy? Right there, okay. In one of the original 60s rock bands here in Singapore called the Stray Dogs. And the Stray Dogs, there were a number of rock bands in the 60s, and several of them were mostly influenced by British pop music at the time. Cliff Richard and the Shadows was huge, okay? But a very small, smaller group were influenced by American kind of blues and, and, and rock and roll, okay? Just, and this is at the time when, you know, Singapore is becoming Singapore, a nation, okay? And so I met this a bit. I suddenly became aware I was kind of had an opening to an aspect of Singaporean history that um, was perhaps important. But I realized I was learning through Keon some very kind of different angles on Singapore society then and perhaps now. And so this is kind of what's emerging out of this, and this is what I want to end on today. One, again, my idea about attention. So what drew these guys to Western pop music, to play Western pop music at this time? Okay, They tell me Cliff Richard and the Shadows. The genre was called pop yeah, yeah, you know, from the Beatles. She loves me, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it's from, okay? <laughs> Um, when I talk to these guys, they tell me that they learned uh, about the music in their families. Keon got his, his uh, first guitar from his sister's boyfriend. Okay? He came over to the house and he thought it was the coolest thing he had ever seen. And then his entire family started playing music. Okay? And he, played, he wanted to play guitar, but his older brother wanted to play guitar, so he played bass. It also is an insight into a Singapore that was, as always been, what was intensely cosmopolitan at the time, both regionally and globally. Um, Western pop music, uh, uh, I think Ben directed me towards some work on Cambodia. Same kinds of things were happening in Cambodia that were happening in Singapore. Um, same kinds of influences, same kinds of bands, Indo-rock in Indonesia as well. Uh, similar kinds of things. Um, so it wasn't just the West, there were lots of things happening regionally in terms of exchanges and circulations and, and attention to music. Me about music, Keon was chi Singaporean Chinese raised in an English speaking household. Okay? They talk about this quite often about English, Malay, Chinese. It's a huge deal whenever they talk about those days. When they talk about those days, they think that the relationships between ethnic groups were much more relaxed. There was much more mixing. One of the famous guitar players from Singapore at that time, who now lives in London, his name was Jimmy, his name, he actually played with him uh, a couple weeks ago, Jimmy Apaderai Chua. Okay. So he's got Jimmy, He's got a Paterai, and he's got Chua, just in his name, okay? Now they think things have gotten much more rigid, much more separated. Keon talks about how back in the past, you know, living on the East Coast, you could hear all kinds of music coming out of everyone's house. I could eat food with my Malay friends. Now I can't eat food with them because of this halal thing. Covers are plain originals. 
the stra- this constant tension in the talk with these guys about whether you're going to play covers and originals. And Shiva Choi, one of the great singers, blues singers from those days, uh, in a um, uh, oral history uh, project that we, all, there's oral histories with these guys all down in the National Museum, already digitized, <laughs> waiting to be listened to and used. Okay. And he says, you know, you, the more you sounded like someone else, the greater hero. So there was this sense that you needed to play cover music, but at the same time somehow come up with your own stuff. <laughs> In the same interview, he says the 60s was a time we had to discover everything for ourselves. So this idea about creativity that is so important today... Um, in Singapore talked about in the past as well. They had trouble playing their music. They could not get gigs. There were several reasons why. But one of the reasons why, they, they, first of all, there weren't many places to play. They played on British bases, military bases. They went to Vietnam to play in Saigon sometimes. They went to KL to play. Uh, and here in town they played at the Orchard Hotel. Uh, so, uh, there were several bars and pubs. They had tea dances, okay, which cha-cha music was played at. And these guys entered the scene playing this rock and roll, whether it was Cliff Richard or the Beats and Blues, and totally disrupted the tea dance thing, causing all kinds of problems. And the, the guys that ran the tea dances apparently hated it, okay. Because, and the audiences didn't like it either because they had gotten used to the cha-cha, samba, mambo music, you know, and wanted to dance. And these guys were playing stuff that no one could dance to. Okay. But at the same time was uh, uh, Lee Kuan Yew's and the PAP's intense anti-yellow uh, culture campaign. Okay. The idea was that if you were associated with Western pop music, it wasn't so much that, you know, the West bad influences, it was the effect it was going to have on your personality and your character, that you would become lazy. Not because of the, well, partly because of the drugs and, you know, wearing long hair, but you wouldn't be, you know, disciplined and productive. So, out of this uh, comes potential topics for, you know, the, uh, that I'm collecting data on at the moment. What is sound control, noise pollution, it's called here, they have to do with musical opportunities? Can we talk about creativity, place, and community? It's very hard to find a place to play music in this town. Real estate prices are totally out the roof, so you can't just start a bar and a little pub and make it on a dime. There are no neighborhoods like that, you know? So it's really tough for bands to find places to play and for bar owners to take in bands to take a chance on, especially doing originals. You can't have bars in housing estates. Mm. Yeah, so right. all housing estates are out. So this has a relation. This is uh, related to some degrees and what people do and how uh, what and and the kind of controls on creativity. Okay? Mm -hmm. This has been probably the most fruitful area of my work so far. I'm hanging out with men again. So the wild masculinity associated with the crone jong. Here I'm talking cock, okay? And talking cock is getting together, drinking tons of alcohol, eating lots of food, and just blowing out the government and everything else that is in your life, you know, and... and in ways that is not often appropriate, like for example in the newspaper for sure, or even in everyday discourse. Okay? And I actually see the kind of rock and roll stuff that we play, and, and when I go and play at the hood uh, with this band, as a kind of large form of talking cock. <laughs> uh, because when I, well, I've played here in town at this place, it's, it is like sitting around in the hawker stall and drinking lots of beer around the hawker table and talking cock, taking over a complete club and doing it. Because it's mostly men, and it's a lot of alcohol, and it's rock and roll kind of, you know, stuff that uh, anti-yellow culture tried to, to push off to the side. It's just been a heck of a lot of fun, and that's my approach to cultural studies. Thank you. Sorry, I went so far.